Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum ladies. Welcome to our final talk oh, in the Muslim self-care conference. I would just like to take a moment to just express my gratitude to firstly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing this to happen and he knows how he allowed it to happen and only he knows subhanallah so i thank him for allowing us to be able to join here together and for all our wonderful panelists being able to make the time for all of you to be able to make and find the time in your days to be here to attend to be a wonderful audience to be fair um, and i ask that allah blesses you all uh, as i said this is our final talk and this is miss amira zaki and she is going to be speaking about how to be fearless in the bedroom so i'm going to hand it over to you sis bismillah take it away bismillah thank you so much sister naima it's a pleasure to be here so i want to start off by getting you to think about your first memories of sex not in terms of your first memory of having sex itself if you're married right now but in terms of when you actually found out what sex was when was that so think back to that moment for yourself and also think back to the kind of thoughts that you had about it and the feelings you had about it. Maybe think about how old were you? Was it a positive thought or a positive feeling or a positive experience that time when you first kind of heard about sex and started understanding what it is and what it involves? Or was it negative thoughts, negative feelings, a negative experience? And there is a kind of broad range there, you know, um, it could be, you know, your experience could be extremely negative or it could be extremely positive. Maybe you were brought up by parents who were very open and talked about sex or maybe you weren't. So I just really want you to just start off by thinking about that. And as you start thinking about those things, I'm going to talk about my experience and what led me to be here today talking to you and sharing my experience. And also, inshallah, I'll talk about the work that I do and why I do it. So for me personally, my kind of first understanding of sex started in year seven. I was in high school and I remember being in a biology lesson and just kind of flicking through the textbook and I happened to land on, a, on, on an image and that image was quite a graphic image. It was like a cartoon image of a man and a woman having sex where you could actually see the penis in the vagina. And when I first looked at it, I didn't understand what was going on. I had never really like thought about sex before. I didn't know what was going on. And I think I read the caption under that image and I was pretty horrified because I was like, what's going on here? Is this really what happens? Um, and I don't know whether you have had something similar happen to you. And then later on, as I went through high school, maybe as I was approaching year 10 and 11, um, I heard one of my friends, she was talking about her older sister. So she was a non-Muslim and she was talking about her older sister and how her older sister had sex for the first time and how extremely painful it was. And when I heard that story, it horrified me once again. And so I also came from a family where my parents didn't really talk to me about sex. And if they did, it was kind of um, brought up in a negative way, like, you are not to have sex whatsoever you need to remain a virgin you know if you have sex that is a huge sin which is all correct but i think the um thoughts and things that i heard about sex and things that i saw related to sex were very very negative and so i just want you to question what how you were brought up and raised uh, uh, in terms of your ideas about sex um later on i started learning a bit more particular things like when a virgin loses her virginity, her hymen has to break. That was the kind of story I heard and how if the hymen breaks, it leads to bleeding and how painful that is. So once again, that brought back horror, with, uh, like that, that horrified feeling, that same horrified feeling. And then I kind of left high school and went on to sixth form just before university and, you know, continued to hear negative stories about sex. It was never really painted in a very good light and then I happened to meet my now husband back then in sixth form and we actually got married really really young we got married at age 18 um, simply because I met him got to know him we liked each other and we didn't want to do haram things together so I told my parents about him he told my parents his parents about me and we got married really really young and I think there are positives and negatives to getting married at such a young young age so we got married but we actually didn't live together until we were 19 so we continued living 
with our own parents for a whole year. And then we decided after a year at age 19, we, got, uh, we decided to move out together. So we moved out together. We rented a one bedroom flat actually near my university. Um, and you know, when we moved out, we decided that that would be our wedding night because we were finally in our own place. So um, we did a kind of little party because we'd already kind of got married and had a big party. Just before we moved out, we did a little party with just my close friends and family. And then we moved into our flat together. And that would have been my wedding night. So I made sure I got dressed up, did my makeup really nice, made sure I was wearing really nice lingerie, as I'm sure if any of you are married, probably did the same sort of thing. And I expected to on that night to go from being a virgin to not being one. But I was really, really anxious. I was really nervous. In fact, I would say I was pretty fearful of that of my wedding night because of all those negative stories I'd heard about how painful it was. I simply had a fear of pain. And I also had a fear of the unknown. I had thoughts coming up inside me where I was wondering, is it true? Is it true what these women say about it being so painful? Surely it must be true because so many people have, 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 have said the same thing. These were the thoughts going on in my head right before doing the deed with my husband. So you know, we, we tried to get in the mood and that kind of thing. We did engage in foreplay and it came, it came to the time where I was about to lose my virginity. And as my husband's penis was entering my vagina, all I could feel was immense pain. So much so that I screamed and told him to get off me because I was like, he's, he's trying to break through my hymen. Surely that's the barrier because in my mind, I thought the hymen was a barrier back then. And I told him to get off me and I was like, I can't do it. And he was like, what's wrong? He tried to reassure me, but I was like, it's too painful and I can't bear it. And so we kind of ended on a negative note. Our wedding night wasn't this positive experience. It was in fact pr a pretty dreadful experience for me. I think I even burst into tears and my husband was like, that's okay, we can try again later, which we did. We tried again, I think probably the next day or the next week and we kept on trying, but the same thing kept happening. It was all, every single time that we tried, it was painful. In fact, every single time that we tried, it seemed to get more and more painful, so much so that I would dread it. And I felt like a pretty lousy wife in terms of I felt like I couldn't satisf satisfy my husband's needs in that way. So we resorted to other methods, things like outer course to satisfy our sexual needs. But there was still this kind of void, this emptiness. I didn't feel like a woman. I was still a virgin in essence because he wasn't able to penetrate me and I really didn't know what to do. And we pretty much lived like that for a whole year. And at the end of that year, um, my husband and I had a conversation and we could see that this was placing such a huge burden in our marriage because only us two knew about this thing. We didn't discuss it with anyone. We didn't talk about it with our family friends. We kind of thought we were the only people in the world to go through this, to have an unconsummated marriage for a whole year. And it got to a point where my husband pretty much said, if this continues, we're probably going to have no choice but to get divorced. He didn't say it in a threatening way. It was just both of us were feeling really disheartened and we didn't know what to do. And so I had a choice in front of me. I could either just allow myself to be a victim and say, OK, that, that's it. I'm going to have to get divorced. Or I decided, even though I was quite young, I decided I'm going to have to do something about this and take this into my own hands. So what I did is I went on the Internet and I started searching for solutions to painful sex. And I kept on doing lots of research and looking at different links. And eventually I came across the term vaginismus. Prior to that, I had never heard of vaginismus in my life. And so as I skimmed through, I was like, surely I don't have this thing called vaginismus, but something was telling me that I just needed to read up about it. So I did. I read up about what vaginismus is. And as I was reading about it, it was like this light bulb moment happened because I was like, that's it. That's exactly what I'm going through. And I couldn't believe it because when I read that it was an actual known medical term, it's a known medical condition, I felt this huge sense of relief because I was like, I know that I'm not the only one. Because if there's a medical term for something, you know that there's at least, there are at least going to be a few people that suffer from this thing. 
And so I continued doing some reading about vaginismus and came to understand that vaginismus was completely curable. And it involved um, different types of therapy using tools known as dilators. And these tools, dilators, are tools that you insert into your vagina. They come in different sizes and you need to practice something called a reverse Kegel. Essentially, what a reverse Kegel is, you might have heard of Kegel exercises. A reverse Kegel is the opposite, where you are actually learning how to get your pelvic floor muscles to be relaxed. Because what I learned about vaginismus is, is that vaginismus is a condition where the pelvic floor muscles, which are the muscles that surround your vagina, those muscles start contracting really tightly in a subconscious way. And the reason they contract really tightly is due to things like fear or worry or stress or anxiety. And that's exactly what was happening for me because I grew up with all of those negative stories, those cultural stories and stories I'd heard from friends, those negative stories about sex created the feelings of fear and worry and anxiety. And that feeling caused my pelvic floor muscles to contract. And when the pelvic floor muscles contract, what happens is the vagina becomes really narrow. And that's the reason why it was impossible for my husband's penis to, pen for, for my husband's penis to penetrate my vagina. And that's the reason why intercourse was so painful for me. So I ordered those dilators because I knew that they would be tools to help me practice, to help me practice getting my pelvic floor muscles to be relaxed. Because if the pelvic floor muscles are relaxed, the vagina is nice and wide and penetration is completely possible and completely pain-free and completely comfortable. So I would love to know why you're here in this talk. Is it because you're currently exp experiencing painful sex? Is it because you, you believe you might have vaginismus? Or is it because you're currently uh, able to have intercourse, but you're not really satisfied? I'd love to know where you are right now. So is it number one, where you're simply experiencing painful sex? Is it number two, where you believe you might have vaginismus? Or is it number three, where you are able to have intercourse, but you're not feeling very satisfied and you want to become more and more fearless in the bedroom? If you could let me know in the chat, that would be great. Okay, so Umwaleed says all three. Okay, anyone else? I know we have, I think, is there 15 of us on here? Okay, so Hava is saying sometimes one, which is painful sex, but most of the time three. So that's the one where she's able to have intercourse, but is not fully satisfied. Uh, Sarah is saying, I have been married for seven years and still have painful sex, no matter how my husband and me tries, and it's never satisfying. Okay, one and three says Rafia. I'm here because I'm curious. Okay, great. RB, could you let me know, are you married or not married? Just so I know. Okay, I believe RB is saying that she's married. Okay, Amina is saying, SubhanAllah, I never realized how common this was until recently speaking to a friend. It takes such courage to speak about this so openly within the Muslim community. Alhamdulillah. Um, actually, quite a lot of people tell me that I have courage to speak about this, but I feel like, I don't feel like that's the case for me. And I'll say why, because right now it feels like more of a duty. It doesn't feel like I need to be brave to share this. It feels like it's something that Allah is compelling me to do, that I, I experienced that trial many years ago, in fact. So I'm now 30. So I got married, as I said, at 18, had my first wedding night experience at 19. So it's been like 11 years or so since that experience. And I didn't talk about it for a long time because I didn't know how to help women in this way up until much more recently where, I, where I, I noticed so many women saying that they have this condition, vaginismus. And so I felt it was my duty to be able to help these women because I went through it and alhamdulillah, I overcame it. And it's now my duty to help women overcome it too. So uh, Habiba saying, I'm not married and I'm here to learn just in case, perfect. So Habiba, could you let me know what are your feelings around the wedding night and what are your feelings and thoughts about losing your virginity? Um, RB saying, I think more sisters need to talk about this openly without feeling shy. Yes, definitely. 
And I, I know that there are quite a lot of um, women, especially on Instagram that I've seen, like Village Auntie and a few others that are talking about sex. Um, but definitely I feel like what I'm talking about is more specific in terms of if you're suffering from painful sex. Okay, so a few of you've said that you're experiencing number one, which is the painful sex. Now, painful sex is obviously quite a broad term and it can be caused by, by almost anything. It, um, so if you're experiencing that broad painful sex where you're not really sure what it's caused by, I would recommend going to see a gynecologist, a female doctor, because usually we're more comfortable with a woman, speaking to a female doctor about what you're experiencing, just so that they can rule out anything else like an infection, for example, or God forbid, a tumor that needs to be ruled out first of all. And obviously I'm not a doctor, but that is what I would recommend if you're experiencing painful sex in general. If the painful sex is upon entry, meaning as soon as your husband's penis goes in and it's pretty painful then, the most likely thing that you're going through is vaginismus. Because what I was describing in my situation, when I tried to lose my virginity on my wedding night, my husband's penis couldn't even go in, not even like the tip. That would be painful. So if you're experiencing painful sex where it's painful at the very beginning, it's likely to be due to vaginismus. Because as I was mentioning, the pelvic floor muscles are contracting and they're causing the whole of the vaginal canal to become really narrow. So it's pretty impossible for the penis to go in. I mean, maybe a little bit can go in like at the tip or maybe a quarter of it, but it's, it gets more and more painful as the penis tries to go in. If, however, you're experiencing painful sex once your husband's penis is already in you, then that could be different. It could be vaginismus if you're kind of clenching up as he's inside you, or if you're experiencing painful sex as he's thrusting inside you, meaning he's moving in and out, that also could be something different, but it could be vaginismus. So this would require talking to a specialist, it could be me or any vaginismus specialist, and saying, describing exactly what your, ex what your experience is so that we can help you deduce whether it's vaginismus or whether it's a different cause because if it is vaginismus, it's very simple to overcome. I mentioned using tools like dilators and learning how to relax your pelvic floor muscles. If there's a different cause, we obviously need to know what the cause is so that we can then identify the solution. Okay, so a few of you are saying also that you're, um, that you're number three, meaning that you're not, you are able to have intercourse, but not really satisfied. So my question for those ladies, and I'd love for you to type it in the chat, um, do you engage in plenty of foreplay? I would love to know the answer to that. So for the women who said that they are number three, meaning that they can have intercourse, but they aren't finding it satisfying, could you let me know? if you are engaging in plenty of foreplay beforehand. So Habiba saying, uh, excitement to be honest here, so I can definitely enjoy sex because, oh, so Habiba I think was the one that said she's not married, but she's feeling excitement, right? Um, so I can definitely enjoy sex because life is too short to be having terrible or painful sex among all the other things happening in the world. Absolutely, I completely agree. I, I think, you know, if we are going to be married to someone, we need to educate ourselves on, to, on how we can actually enjoy sex. I'm sure that Village Auntie preaches about this on how we as women need to empower ourselves and learn actually what is it that turns me on? What is it that I like in the bedroom? How can I communicate with my husband and get him to do the things that I really want to do? And for us to not be shy and to realize it's a partnership with your husband that communication is key in every sense, in, in, in every single relationship and communicating what you want your husband to do to you. It's that giving and receiving. It's not about you only pleasuring your husband or your husband only pleasuring you. It needs to be that two way street, definitely. So Rafia said, I've seen consultant gynecologists and I've been told that there are no issues and just need to relax. Yeah, I know. So sometimes, um, so I've had a few clients that say similar things about just relax. And sometimes saying that to a client is easier said than done. If you, especially if you don't know how to relax. Um, one thing I do recommend to some of my clients is spending time before engaging in sex, 
spending time on your own and because as you're here you're here in the self-care conference spending time on your own and figuring out what is it that I want to do for myself right now? So something that I do usually before I engage in sex with my husband is I decide what do I really need right now? Because if I don't do that, I end up resenting my husband. I end up feeling like I'm giving sex to him and that I'm not receiving anything back. And so for me personally, and I'm sure that this will resonate with a lot of women too, for me personally, I need my emotional cup filled. So what I tend to do before engaging in sex with my husband is I, I'll make sure the kids are in bed and I will just run a nice warm bath with candles, with oils, and I will just lay there for an hour. And that is my me time. I'm filling myself up. And then I feel a lot more ready to then engage in sex with my husband and I enjoy it more as well because if I don't do that I'll feel like I've been so busy during the day with work and with kids and then feel really frantic before engaging in sex without having that me time ends up in you not really having a satisfying experience okay so what else have we got here we've got uh, just need to make this bigger um okay so Arby saying she agrees with Habiba Oh yeah, so uh, Rafia was saying that she's just been told that she needs to relax. So is the gynecologist saying that you need to relax so that you um, don't have painful sex? Because if that's what the gynecologist is saying, really what we need to be taught is how. How do we get our pelvic floor muscles to relax? Because once we know how to get them to relax, then we won't experience painful sex anymore. Um, I can see that Habiba is saying, I follow village auntie. She's so amazing, mashallah. Yeah, I completely agree. Have I saying most of the time we have foreplay? Great. So foreplay is so important. Now foreplay isn't the only way to ensure that you are having satisfying sex. It's also about you deciding that you are going to make your orgasm a priority in every single session that you have sex with your husband. So I'm gonna say that again. Having a satisfying sex life with your husband is about you deciding that your orgasm is a priority in every single sex session that you have with your husband. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to want to have sex. You'll come up with excuses, I'm tired, maybe later, that kind of thing. Whereas if you know that you are guaranteed to orgasm during the next time that you have sex with your husband, you're going to want to do it. So that's why I say it's so important to prioritize your orgasm. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, I don't know how to orgasm or it's very, very fleeting, meaning sometimes I can orgasm, sometimes I can't. When it comes to orgasm, it is definitely about trial and error. I believe that each one of us here, each woman here, orgasms in a different way. There is something that might turn me on that won't turn you on and vice versa. So it's about you maybe spending time journaling. What is it that turns me on? Is it, and it kind of also comes down to your love language as well. So for me personally, I love words, words of affirmation. They really turn me on. So if my husband is saying certain things, that will turn me on. Um, it might be the same for you and it might be different. Okay, so it's about deciding and, and trialing what is it that firstly turns me on before I even engage in sex and what is it that continues to get me in the mood when I'm having sex in the middle of all that foreplay. Okay, uh, where do we go to? Um, Subhanallah, when my, so this is Zafreen, she's saying, Subhanallah, when my periods were starting, I had really bad period pains the doctors diagnosed that I didn't have the path for the period to flow out. So I had a little operation. So don't know if that would have been bad. Uh, so you said vaginitis, vaginitis, vaginitis. I'm assuming you, you mean vaginismus. Okay, so if your period wasn't able to flow out and you had to have a little operation for your periods to flow out, that could have led to vaginismus. So vaginismus can also be caused by some kind of trauma or surgery. It's usually known as secondary vaginismus. It can even happen to women after childbirth. So a woman can have intercourse, 
get pregnant and everything is fine. There was no pain with intercourse beforehand. And then as soon as she gives birth and, you know, after a period of time when she is able to have intercourse again, she goes to have intercourse and realizes that it's now so painful. And that's usually known as secondary vaginismus, perhaps due to trauma or the pain of childbirth. And so that would require re-educating and using the dilators as therapy to get your pelvic floor muscles to relax again. So what you were mentioning about having to, needing to have an operation, that could have, le have led to vaginismus. It can lead to painful sex, definitely. Um, one thing I want to mention before I continue to um, read the, the comments here is um, the operation that you're mentioning, I'm assuming, is a hymenectomy. A hymenectomy is the removal of the hymen. Now, what I will say is that this surgery is not really needed for most women unless it's an extreme circumstance like, like what Zafreen was mentioning. She mentioned that her period wasn't able to flow out perhaps because the hymen was very, very thick and rigid and didn't have any perforations or holes in it. And that's why the period couldn't flow through. So in that instance, she would need to have an hymenectomy. However, in most women who have vaginismus, meaning they have painful sex, many of them wrongly assume that it's because of their hymen they wrongly assume that their hymen is still intact and that their hymen is too rigid. Um, and so some doctors will say, we need to remove your hymen. And in 99% of the cases, actually the hymen doesn't need to be removed because the hymen is not the cause of vaginismus. What I learned in, my, in the work that I do is that the hymen actually is a very, very thin, stretchy membrane that all girls are born with. And as a baby girl grows up and becomes um, a teenager and then a, young, and then a young adult, that hymen over time becomes more and more stretchy and actually starts to break and wear away naturally over the course of time. And for many girls, especially if girls are quite active, doing any kind of sport, it doesn't have to be just horse riding, it could be any sport, the hymen can actually just completely break for any, any girl, even though she's a virgin. And so what I, the reason I'm saying this is because it will usually go unnoticed. The girl won't even realize that her hymen is broken because the hymen itself doesn't cause any pain. So most, this is what I heard when I was growing up, most people assume that the pain that a virgin experiences when she has sex for the first time, they assume that it's because of the hymen breaking. The reality is the hymen, the hymen itself is a very thin membrane and it has hardly any nerve endings or it might have none at all. It might have no nerve endings. And what that means is the pain doesn't actually come from the hymen. When a virgin loses her virginity and if she experiences pain, it's actually because of the pelvic floor muscles. Naturally, a virgin who's about to lose her virginity, she's feeling a bit anxious and worried. And so, like I mentioned earlier, if you're having that anxiety and that stress and worry, your pelvic floor muscles will contract subconsciously. You won't even realize that it's happened. And if the pelvic floor muscles are contracted, the vagina is going to be very narrow and penetration is going to be very, very painful or impossible. So that is the pain that a virgin is going through. And so another thing that I do is I love to educate non-married women on how they can actually lose their virginity in a completely painless way. And essentially it's the same work that you need to do to overcome vaginismus. So as I mentioned, to overcome vaginismus, I do recommend doing what I call insertion exercises. It's practice exercises where you insert different sizes of dilators. It's you just practicing how to insert something into your own vagina, a bit like a woman inserting a tampon when she has her period. So practicing with these dilators so that you know for yourself that there is no pain there. You know for yourself that you can do it once you know how to do a reverse Kegel exercise. And you can go and search it online, search how to do reverse Kegel exercises, so K-E-G-E-L reverse Kegel exercises essentially teach you how to relax the pelvic floor muscles so that you can insert a tampon or a dilator really easily. And if you can insert a tampon or a dilator easily, you can also do the same thing 
with your husband's penis. So for non-married women who are, inshallah, one day to be married, if you want to have a, a pleasant experience on your wedding night where there is no pain, where you're not feeling any worry or stress, in fact, you're feeling really confident, I highly recommend that you spend time learning how to do reverse Kegel exercises and spend time learning how to insert something. If you don't wanna go and buy dilators, just go and buy a pack of tampons and practice with them because the process of insertion is the same. To insert a tampon into your vagina requires the same process as inserting your husband's penis. It literally requires you learning how to do reverse Kegel exercises, relaxing your pelvic floor muscles. And that same thing applies to learning how to overcome painful sex if you've ruled out infection or vaginismus if you know that you have it. Okay, let's see what else we have in the chat. So uh, Zora is saying, to be honest, lots of doctors don't even know what vaginismus is. And if you talk to them about it, they'll be like, no, there is no way that you have that or they don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely right, Zora, that's true. It's very unfortunate. I don't believe that there is much training provided to doctors about vaginismus. Um, so that's, I think, why I had to step up to this role because I personally chose not to speak to a doctor about it. I self-diagnosed myself um, when, I, when I realized that I had vaginismus and I treated myself. I didn't go to the doctor for treatment. I ordered the dilators myself and spent time practicing with them. And when I was able to use all of the dilators, I then transitioned to intercourse with my husband again and his penis was able to go in me for the very first time and there was zero pain and that that was essentially the time I really fully lost my virginity to him and so when when I when I noticed that there was no pain I was like why was I worried so much there is no pain um, and so I realized that if a woman is going around and saying I've had sex for the first time and it was horrific it was so painful the reason it was so painful for her, it's true for her, it's valid for her in her reality. The reason it was so painful for her was because unfortunately, she didn't have the education that we're learning now. She maybe didn't know much about her pelvic floor muscles and how she needed to practice getting them relaxed. And the great thing about having vaginismus or having painful sex is that most of the time, we can empower ourselves to overcome it. I speak to a lot of my clients and I say that having the condition vaginismus is not like having cancer. If someone has cancer, God forbid, a lot of things are not in your control. Yes, you can improve your diet and take your medications and all of that, but there are still other factors out of, outside of your control, mostly in Allah's control, where you don't know if you're going to overcome the cancer. Um, whereas with something like vaginismus, it's literally fully in the woman's control, subhanAllah. In order for you to overcome vaginismus and overcome painful sex, if it's not caused by something like a tumor or uh, an infection, in order to overcome vaginismus, it's literally about going within, within yourself. It's about reframing the thoughts that you're having about sex, changing those thoughts to be positive ones. Instead of inheriting stories and thoughts from other people about sex, which we tend to do, we inherit the stories from our parents about sex or our friends about sex or from the media or TV. We inherit all those negative stories about sex and those negative stories create the negative feelings of stress, worry, anxiety, fear. We can choose, like, just like we chose to inherit those thoughts, we can choose to disregard those thoughts because they're not serving us and choose to inherit positive thoughts about sex, especially if we are doing them in alignment with the way Allah wants us to have intercourse with our husband. Because I'm sure you all agree and all know that having intercourse is abuse. It should be a beautiful experience. Allah created it for pleasure between the spouses and it's, um, Allah didn't design it to be a painful experience or an experience that you dread. He designed it where you actually enjoy it more and more and you learn about your spouse at the same time. Okay, so let's continue reading through the comments. Um, Zora is saying, also, a lot of women don't satisfy penetrative sex and need clitoral stimulation. Absolutely. So that was a point that I was going to come to, so I'll talk about it now, is 
there, there are several ways for women to experience orgasm. It could be through manual stimulation. It could be through the husband regularly stimulating the clitoris, as Zora is mentioning. Um, actually, most women don't experience orgasm during intercourse. It tends to require a lot of trial and error. So for me personally, I've learned exactly what my body wants when my husband is penetrating me, exactly what motions I need to do, what movements I need to do, how I need to rhythmically contract my own pelvic floor muscles once he is inside me. Because once, when I rhythmically contract my own pelvic floor muscles when he's inside me, that leads me to have an orgasm. So it is about you learning what is the rhythm that you need to do to experience orgasm during intercourse. And if you're not able to have an orgasm during intercourse, don't let that session end. Don't let your husband go away satisfied if you haven't experienced orgasm. Communicate with him in that moment and say, I haven't had an orgasm, this is what I want you to do. And go back to that trial and error. What exactly is it? Have you ever experienced an orgasm in the past? What was it that allowed you to achieve an orgasm and go back and try that again? Because it could be that that is exactly what he needs to go and do again. Yes, well, <laughs> absolutely, Naima. I see at the bottom, you said, ladies come first. That's actually really important. I know that you might be giggling about that, but actually it is really important for the woman to orgasm first. And if you don't orgasm first, it's not the end of the world. Let's say your husband does orgasm first. Don't allow that session to end there. Demand your right to have an orgasm. So say, I haven't had an orgasm. This is what I want you to do to get me to orgasm. OK, but yes, definitely. If you are able to orgasm first, if you're able to come first, that makes things a lot better because he can then continue to achieve his orgasm if you've already come first. So the way I describe it is if you're if if your husband is penetrating you and you feel that you're about to orgasm, but you're not yet ready and he is definitely ready to orgasm, tell him to come out of you. Tell him I'm not ready to orgasm. Tell him to go back and do a bit more foreplay, do a little bit more manual stimulation until you're right at the point where you're about to orgasm. And then you can tell him to go back inside you and try then. And you might come at the same time, you might come before him, but I do recommend definitely that you orgasm first as much as possible. If you can't, like I said, um, if, he, if he comes before you, go back and claim your right, demand your right and say, this is what I want you to do so that I can orgasm too. Uh, okay, so we've got Rafia saying, yes, that's what I say. Well, that's what they say, sorry. I find that if I haven't had sex in a week or two, then it becomes really tight and painful for entry and painful during it. Okay, so yes, yeah, sometimes if you haven't had sex for a week or two, it can become tight, but not for the reasons that you might think. Because in actual fact, if you think about your menstrual cycle, you may or may not know that there are actually four different phases that occur during the menstrual cycle. Most of us know of the period part, the bit where we see the blood, but that's only one part, that's the menstrual phase. There are other phases, the luteal phase, the follicular phase, and the ovulatory phase. And usually during the ovulatory phase, naturally our vagina is usually at that time, it's usually longer and wider and it's usually more naturally lubricated from the inside. And so during the ovulatory phase, it's usually about day 14 of your cycle, roughly. Um, meaning if you had your period today, day one, 14 days later, roughly, would be your ovulatory phase. And it usually lasts about three to five days. It varies from woman to woman. So at that point, that tends to be the time when sex is the least painful, it's the most comfortable, it's usually the most pleasurable. Women tend to be more horny at that time and more in the mood for sex. So the other phases, you need to work out. So I mentioned the luteal phase and follicular phase. There are apps and things that you can download to work out which phase you're in. In, the other, in some of the other phases, we tend to be less lubricated naturally. And so if you realize that, um, sex is a bit more painful for you, if, especially if you've had a little bit of a break for a week or two from sex. What I would recommend in those instances is using something like lubrication. 
uh, it could be an artificial lubricant or it could be something that most of us probably have in our homes, a natural lubricant like coconut oil. And a lot of women actually that I've spoken to say that they do really like the coconut oil because there isn't any irritation when they use it. Sometimes when you use an artificial lubricant, um, it can produce a little bit of irritation. So go ahead and use something like coconut oil, apply it to his penis and apply it to the outside of your vagina. And that should make it a lot more comfortable and less painful. Uh, where are we up to? I can't find my, where I was. Um, oh yeah. So Zafrain is saying, oh gosh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think like that. It's true. I don't enjoy sex at all because it's just same old stuff. You're making me laugh so much in a nice way. Vaginismus, new word. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that it's a new word and it's just great to know, even if you don't have it, it's great to know what vaginismus is because you might be talking to one of your friends, you know, maybe newly married or about to get married. And if they're describing that they have a fear of sex or if they're describing that they tried to have sex because they're now married and they can't and it's too painful you can say i know what this condition is it's it's probably vaginismus and then they can then take it into their own hands and empower themselves to learn more about it um okay uh habib is saying read read the old is it read or read read the older of a virgin oh read that the older a virgin woman is the less likely it is for there to be any bleeding. Is this true? I don't believe so. I don't think it has anything to do with age. Um, bleeding actually shouldn't really occur in a virgin woman. And if it does, it should be very minimal. I know there are certain cultures where they expect there to be a lot of blood in order to prove that the bride was or is a virgin. Um, I believe it's completely ridiculous. In As I mentioned, in most girls, as they grow from being a young girl into a teenager and then a young adult, in most girls, the hymen um, kind of disintegrates over time due to any kind of activity. And so that might have led to small amounts of blood that maybe the girl didn't even pay attention to or realize that it happened. And so if there is a lot of bleeding when a woman loses her virginity, it's not because of the hymen or anything. It's probably because she was nervous she was afraid to lose her virginity and as the husband is penetrating and thrusting the, the friction of his penis against the tight vagina because and it's tight because of the pelvic floor muscles contracting that rough penetration um or probably he entered quite sharply and forcefully um that would have led to the bleeding not because of the hymen and definitely doesn't have anything to do with the older a virgin woman is, the less likely for there to be bleeding. Um, I don't think that that is true. I could be wrong, but I don't think that's correct. Uh, okay, RB is saying in school, many years ago, we were taught that the hymen usually breaks by the age of eight due to being active, etc. cetera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It does, it usually breaks, it kind of becomes more stretchy over time and it definitely forms perforations. Actually, one thing I also talk about with my clients is if you ever have had a period, you know for sure that your hymen is not intact. There may still be remnants of the hymen inside your vagina if you're a virgin, but you know at least there's definitely perforations. It's definitely stretchy because in order for the period blood to come through your vagina, the hymen shouldn't really be intact. There should be some perforations and holes in it in order for the period blood to come to go through. So if you have had a period, you know that your hymen is not an issue in terms of when you lose your virginity. So when you're not married, I strongly recommend that you educate yourselves before you get married in the future about how to do reverse Kegel exercises, learning how to relax your pelvic floor muscles, and even spending time learning how to insert something, whether it be a tampon or whether it be dilators. Another thing I wanna mention on that note is some women are afraid to do those insertion exercises before getting married because they feel like they are losing their virginity before they're even married. My definition of losing your virginity is when a man's penis enters your vagina for the first time. I don't know what your definition is, but I'm sure that we can agree, hopefully, that in order for a woman to lose her virginity, a man's penis needs to penetrate her vagina. If you are inserting a tampon, you, you haven't broken your virginity or lost your virginity. If you're inserting something like a dilator, which is pretty similar to a tampon, 
again, you're not losing your virginity. I like to think of it as practice. I use the analogy of running a marathon for the first time. And we know that running a marathon is pretty hardcore. And so if I said that you are going to run a marathon in six months time for the very first time, you've never run a marathon before. And in six months time, you have to run a marathon. Would you allow those six months to just pass and not practice anything and wait until the day and just go and aim for it and try and run the marathon? Because just imagine if you try to do that, you probably wouldn't be able to complete it and it would be very, very painful. And that's the same with intercourse. If you know that you're going to get married or you currently are married, if you know that you're about to have intercourse for the first time in six months time because you're going to get married or in a year's time, are you just going to allow those six months or a year to go by without practicing anything first? And that's the reason why I think many women have painful intercourse for the first time because they didn't do the practice and the practice is actually twofold it does require a lot of mental training identifying what thoughts you have about sex that are not serving you and also there is physical training like i said learning how to do the, re uh, the reverse kegels re learning how to relax the pelvic floor muscles and learning how to do the physical training in terms of learning how to actually insert something into your vagina because what i will tell you is when i first started using the dilators the first time I inserted it into my, into, the first time I inserted something into my vagina, I was like, wow, this feels so weird. That's all that I felt. I was like, so strange because most women as virgins have never experienced something inside them. So it really should just feel a little bit strange, a little bit weird, but there shouldn't be any pain involved. Okay. So, um, had, oh, we've got RB replying to Habiba saying intercourse usually becomes painful after menopause due to a lack of natural vaginal lubric lubrication due to re reduced estrogen. Yes, abso absolutely. So in that case, if, if a woman, I don't know if any women on here are uh, menopausal or postmenopausal, but in that case, definitely what's usually recommended is to increase the amount of lubrication that you use. Um, what have we got? Just moving down there. So Zora is saying, I think orgasms are more mental rather than anything else. Yes, you've hit the nail on the head. I think for us as women, it definitely is. Um, if my if I had a really busy, frantic day, and if I didn't do that time where I had my own kind of me time before having sex with my husband, I think all of my thoughts would be racing in my head and I wouldn't be able to focus on achieving an orgasm. So definitely is a lot more mental. It is about what you're thinking about. I, this is going to sound, this might sound really strange, but I'm going to be really, really authentic and honest with you. I, as I mentioned, I really like it when my husband speaks to me during intercourse. And I don't know what other men are like, but personally, my husband doesn't really like to talk during intercourse, even though I've told him, I would really like it if you would talk to me during intercourse. Um, and so sometimes I need to just, if I want to orgasm, because I, I've chosen now to prioritize orgasm during each session that I have sex with my husband, I start thinking in my head about things that he's saying to me. And that just turns me on. And it seems to work for me. So I definitely think it is a more mental, emotional thing. And it's about you trying to identify what is it that turns you on? What is it that will get you to achieve an orgasm? Um, what have we got here? Rafia is saying using a coil, so no periods. Okay. So uh, I'm assuming you're saying that maybe because you're not sure about, is that because I mentioned about um, having your hymen not be intact? If you could let me know what that's referring to, Rafia, or if you have a question around that, let me know. RB is saying, remember, ladies, we, ha we women have. Uh, the ability to multi-orgasm that there is a hadith that states that women have the ability to enjoy passion longer yeah definitely um and Armina is saying are there any particular dilators that you recommend no any dilators will do i use some plastic ones but right now on the market there are so many different types um, some of my clients prefer to use silicon ones because they say they're more comfortable having said that many 
of my clients still use just regular plastic ones like I did. So no, I don't re recommend any particular brands. What I do recommend is that they come in a set of at least four, that tends to work. You can get a set of five or six as well. Um, where was I? Rafia saying, referring to the period cycles you mentioned. Oh, right, okay. So if you're on, if you're on the coil and therefore you don't have a period, um, you still have those phases occurring in you. You still have a menstrual cycle, even though you don't have the period blood, the menstrual phase, which is where the blood comes out. In that instance, what I do recommend is um, doing a little bit of research and um, finding out how you can figure out when you are in the ovulatory phase, when you are in the luteal phase and the follicular phase. Like I said, there are some apps that will help you with that. One that comes to mind is an app called In The Flow. Um, so it's F-L-O, so In The Flow, that's one app that comes to mind that might be able to help you with that. Uh, Fahir is saying, describe the orgasm experience. Never had an orgasm during sex. Perfect, that's a great question. Um, and actually a lot of my clients have asked me similar ones where they don't know if they've achieved an orgasm because they've never felt it before. So this is how I will describe it to you from my own personal experience. And if any of you ladies have experienced an orgasm, I'd love it if you could describe your experience too. So for me personally, um, as one of the other sisters was mentioning about how achieving an orgasm is very much a mental experience. For me personally, it starts off with how I'm feeling and what I'm thinking about before engaging in foreplay with my husband, before I start kissing and touching with my husband, where are my thoughts at? Am I really focused and present in the moment? Um, once I'm there and I'm then enjoying the foreplay, I kind of just allow my mind to just imagine that I am this extremely sexy woman. And sometimes for us as women, it's hard to imagine that. But if I don't do that, I will tend to focus on all my flaws, the flaws that I think I have, the cellulite on my thighs, the my belly fat, that's where my mind will usually tend to go. And so if I do that, I know that I won't get, I won't, I, I won't achieve an orgasm if I'm focusing on my cellulite or my belly fat. And so what I know that I have to consciously do is in that moment, I have to choose that I am this sexy woman. And obviously in the eyes of my husband, I am, but I have to believe it for myself. And I also have to believe that in that moment, me being naked there or in my lingerie, whatever, in that moment, Allah also has told me that in that moment, I am sexy. And the reason I say that is because we all know that as women, we are told to cover up certain parts of our body because if we don't do that these there are certain areas of our body if we are naked that are naturally sexually appealing to the opposite sex so Allah has instructed us to cover up certain areas of our body uh, with full knowledge that if the opposite sex were to see us with those parts revealed they would be naturally sexually appealed and attracted to us uh, Allah doesn't say that only cover up if you have really thin thighs or only cover up if you have a flat belly or only cover up if you have big perky breasts. Allah has never instructed us to do that. He instructs us as women to cover up regardless of what our body size and shape looks like. That means that Allah believes that we are naturally sexually appealing and Allah created us naturally sexually appealing. So we have to choose what are we going to believe are we going to believe what allah is telling us or are we going to believe what society is telling us because society has said that a certain body size and shape is sexy and anything else is not that's what society is telling us and society is made up of people are we just going to believe what people are telling us or are we going to believe what allah is telling us so in that moment i have to choose to believe that i am sexy and because if i believe i'm sexy I can get in the mood. And so that's where the orgasm starts. It's believing you're sexy, making sure you're in the right mental state, making sure you spent time doing your own self-care and then really enjoy the foreplay with your husband. Really enjoy that moment of intimacy with your husband. Enjoy the kissing, enjoy the touching, enjoy the giving and receiving and allow it to build up. So for most women, the first kiss, the first touch, isn't really what is going to turn you on. It needs to be continuous. The
the kissing, the touching, the hugging, the caressing needs to be continuous. And as, as it continues, you end up getting more and more in the mood for it. The, your level of horniness, the only word that came to mind, increases as you engage in more and more foreplay with your husband. And so what it comes to is all of that kind of comes to this culmination of feeling really breathless, really excited, really um, like intrigued and almost like you can't wait. You can't wait to release it. All of that kind of excitement builds up and you really can't wait to release it. And when you get to that point, it's the point where you're kind of about to climax, about to orgasm, if your husband continues to satisfy you and continues to stimulate you in that way. And so if he does continue to stimulate you, what an orgasm feels like is as though all of those feelings and that kind of sexual tension has been released. And what you will feel is a really deep satisfaction. That's what it should feel like, a really deep kind of bliss as well. Like it feels really amazing, um, almost like you really want to have this big beam or smile on you. So it's like the sexual tension has been released. It feels really blissful and pleasurable. That's when you know that you've had an orgasm, especially if you're feeling really satisfied and feeling like you don't need to continue anymore, that you don't need to have sex anymore. That's how you would know that you've had an orgasm, okay? Some women do also release fluid as well when they have an orgasm, so that can be another way to know. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so there we've got another sister saying, there is a tool that a company sells different than dilators, but does the same thing. Maybe some sisters will be curious or want to try it, onuts.co. Rings that are inserted in the penis that act almost like a barrier. Not really a barrier, but they sort of make you more comfortable. Yeah, I've heard of Onut. So yeah, uh, this sister's right. The rings that you insert on the penis, um, there are, I think, different, like there are different numbers of rings. You can insert one or two, I think. And it just kind of prevents your husband's penis from going too deeply inside you to make the sex a bit more comfortable. Because for some women, they, their experience of painful sex is due to the thrusting and his penis going too deep inside your vagina. So what the sister's mentioning about the company onot.co, that might be helpful for certain women. Um, this is so helpful, Marshall. In my husband's eyes, I'm, I'm Miss Wonderful, absolutely. But I feel permanently modest. Even now I have three children. Yeah, so I think modesty definitely is important. Um, you know, when you're not around your husband, but when you're with your husband, you want to kind of let go. And it's kind of, um, how do I describe this? It's kind of like, it, you are this gift, you are this blessing to your husband, which is what you are. And it's about you deciding that your husband deserves to see this gift, to see this blessing, as much as you deserve to see him. And so, really also it's it comes down to you deciding that you are worthy of having an amazing sex life you are, it's like commonly depicted as you know usually it's the man that always initiates having sex which can happen or usually the man has a higher libido than the woman but what really should be happening happening is more of a balance in terms of where you loved the last time that you had sex with your husband so much that you really can't wait for the next one. And that will in fact increase your libido. Your desire for, for, for sex will increase if the last time you had sex was amazing. If the last time you had sex was one where you had this amazing orgasm, you're going to want to have it again. Whereas if your sex life right now is mediocre or not really satisfying, your libido is probably gonna go down because there's nothing special about it. Um, so really, that's why I say it's so important for us women to prioritize having an orgasm during every time that you have sex with your husband. Um, we've got another sister saying, I get a rush of blood to my head during or orgasm. Yeah, perfect. So it kind of is that thing I was describing of like feeling really blissful and like your mind isn't anywhere else in that moment. When you're having an orgasm, you're not thinking about your to-do list. You're not thinking about your children. You're not thinking about work the next day. You're literally just in that moment, 
allowing yourself to experience experience the pleasure and, and bliss um so yeah definitely another sister saying me too like electricity in my head and my ears get like dull inside of my vagina my muscle is pumping yeah definitely it's that rhythmic contraction of the pelvic floor muscles surrounding the vagina you're very welcome so we've got thank you so much it was very helpful and the sister's giving you, you the website for onot.co oh because she sent it to panelists only so she's providing it for everyone now um another sister describing how she has an orgasm so for me it's an immense surge of energy that travels up and around my body i can feel pleasurable contractions which subside slowly i then feel completely calm absolutely good so that feeling of having the orgasm and it's kind of all that culmination of excitement and bliss and then you feel really calm and satisfied like you don't need you don't need any further caressing or stimulation you just feel like you can just relax and melt into the bed type of thing is there food that helps boost sex yeah there are certain foods um they're known as aphrodisiacs um i, I believe that chocolate is one of them i think oysters is another on the note of foods that help boost sex one thing i do want to mention which i believe um sister idil talked about during her talk was is about nutrition um and the reason why it's i mean it's so great that there were so many different talks during the conference but the reason why i'm bringing up nutrition is because you mentioned food um, and how food is related to sex i believe they are so related and interconnected when we improve our nutrition our libido will naturally okay um when you are in, when you improve your nutrition you are feeding yourself all this amazing good stuff so you feel good on the inside and when we feel good on the inside we're going to feel good on the outside too also things like if you have poor body image or poor self-esteem when you improve your nutrition that nutrition is is chemistry in your body and that chemistry is sending signals to your brain and then you are going to by changing your nutrition you are essentially reframing the thoughts in your brain and you're going to start to think differently about yourself and your self-worth and deciding that i'm worthy of eating amazing healthy food and i'm worthy of having this amazing sex life and they are very much interrelated and interconnected because i know for myself if I don't eat very healthily and I'm feeling really, really bloated because I've eaten, uh, I've eaten quite a lot of junk food that day, for example, or I've eaten a lot of food that has foods that, that I am pretty sensitive to. If I eat those foods and I am feeling bloated, then I'm not going to want to have sex. Or if I do have sex when I'm feeling bloated like that, it's not going to be that satisfying. And I'm probably going to be concentrating on the feelings of bloatedness rather than concentrating on how good i feel and so by eating really good nutrition in general it's going to help you to have a better sex life and it's going to help you in terms of your libido one sister's meant mentioning ginseng tea intimacy is supposed to be a taste of jenna i love that i really feel that it is if you've experienced an amazing orgasm you you know how amazing it is and so if it is a taste of Jenna, wow, just imagine what Jenna is like. Like if, if, if having an orgasm is bliss on earth and that's just a portion of what it will be like in Jenna, we can only just imagine how much bliss there will be in Jenna for all of us, inshallah. Uh, thank you, very educated. Thank you, sister. Another sister saying hibiscus tea. I found out recently that it's given to brides as a gift. Okay, great really helpful i took a lot of notes we yucky anything else i think i mean i finished you know what i wanted to talk about in terms of you know my experience and what vaginismus is and how we can kind of um improve our sex lives is there anything else sisters that you want me to talk about it's been so fun so so amazing to be able to talk to all of you ladies about this thank you so much amira jazakallah khair and i just really like your really frank straightforward way of just talking about it you know it really just reminds me that this is just knowledge and you know how so many times when we talk about sex and you know even just bodily functions there is so much kind of shame and tittering kind of energy behind it 
but you just broke it down for us literally literally like a science lesson <laughs> this is what it is it's yeah. like that this is what you need to do and this is what happens if this happens and i'm sure the sisters really appreciated your just super down to earth approach mashallah uh and yeah guys you know make sure that you do connect with uh, sister amira on instagram you know if you if you need her help no shame in your game get in touch send her a dm um did you have something to offer the sisters uh, was there like a webinar or an ebook that you've offered them already yeah so any sisters if you are struggling with vaginismus or painful sex i do have a free 90 minute training the link for that is in my bio so you can definitely check that out i'm on instagram so yeah definitely check it out inshallah alternatively if you don't want to watch the free training and you just want to ask me some questions and see potentially if we can work together to help you overcome your vaginismus or overcome painful sex or if you're not married how i can help you to you know look forward to your wedding night and how you can lose your virginity in a painless way just send me a message on instagram too i'm happy to have a little chat and when you message her, just ask her, oh, sis, uh, have you written a book by any chance? Is there anything that I can read, inshallah? <laughs> inshallah, I hope so. I hope so soon. It's on pause at the moment, but it's definitely not, it's not like lost my, like it's not lost from my mind. It's still there. When it's not a lot sooner than later. Definitely. <laughs> yes. And it's been a pleasure working with you, Naima, and your team on, yeah. on getting it started. Um, I still have the drafts. I need to work on it. And inshallah, it will be ready for everyone soon. In its time. Well, everything in the best time, mashallah. inshallah. So listen, ladies, uh, if you have any more questions, you can always send uh, Sister Amira a DM. And, um, you know, inshallah, uh, she will answer any of your questions there. But for now, I just would like to invite you all just to take a deep breath together a big nice one Ooh, and exhale and just give yourselves a hug and a pat on the back because you have been absolutely amazing i know some of you have literally been for every session since friday i want to acknowledge you i want to honor you and may allah love you and may allah bless you and your families it's been absolutely amazing and hey, what can I say? Let's do it again, inshallah. Um, yeah. Those of you, if you haven't got a ticket for the Black Muslim Festival, grab that ticket, come and join us and I'll see you at some of our sessions next month. Uh, if not, keep a lookout for the next virtual salon sisters session. Uh, I'm not sure yet what we're going to be looking at next. Uh, we might actually ask you guys to give us some suggestions for you want us to cover in our next sister's session. But for now, I bid you good night, farewell, and may Allah bless you all. I'm so pleased that it was beneficial for you. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanak Allahumma rabbana bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant wa astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Thanks guys. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.